Hi, and welcome to the center. I'm Carolyn Merrick, a program coordinator, and I'm very excited tonight to have with us Kim Porter. She's an ex Charlottesvillian, but more importantly, Kim is the executive director of uh, Be a Part of the Conversation, which is a wonderful place up in the Pennsylvania area. Um, and they, their mission is to provide people with the skills and the resources to understand substance abuse, uh, addiction, and related health issues. Uh, they provide community programs such as this one. They foster supportive connections, highlight lived experiences, and challenge the stigmas that are associated with these topics. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim. And Kim, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. That's okay. All right. Are you seeing? Yes. Looks okay, good. Great. All right. Thank you. So yes, the organization is called Be a Part of the Conversation, and we really do focus on community. So this is very grassroots. Uh, this just shows our mission that we equip families and communities with skills and resources to understand substance use and addiction and everything that comes along with that. Uh, so our programs um, are all about substance use from prevention to early intervention to crisis management. Um, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about why this is important to me. So um, this is me with my dad when I was very little. Um, my dad is 90 years old now. My dad got sober when he was 66. So um, recovery is possible at any age, um, but I was around this for a long time in my life. Um, but things really changed when my son became another person in my life who has a substance use disorder. And this is my son, Daniel, and I'm looking sad there because it was last Thanksgiving and he was going back to Colorado where he lives and I miss him very much, but I'm so grateful that he's in recovery today. Um, and he was born in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. So he's a Char he's a Virginian as well. He's a Charlottesvillian as well. Is that how you say it? Charlottesvillian? <laughs> That's how I'm saying it. Yep. <laughs> okay. That's for me. Um, yes. So he's uh, 34 years old now and he has 12 and a half years in recovery. But I have another picture that I show of Daniel. This is a much older picture. He was 14 years old here. That's him with his dad and his sister. And he was doesn't normally wear a bow tie as a child, but he was in a marching band. No, it was a band competition. And he was in the uh, he's a drummer in the percussion ensemble. But we went to Baskin Robbins. Very wholesome family outing. The reason I show this picture is, as I said, he was 14. The first time Daniel got high, he was 13. It was a year before this picture was taken. I mean, look at that sweet little face. You just can't believe that somebody, I, we knew nothing. Uh, his dad is a physician. I worked from home. I was a very active and involved parent. I could give you all the, the um, bona fides under the sun about how um, solid a parent I was, but we missed it. We totally missed it. We didn't know anything about his substance use until he was 18 and he got sober when he was 21. So those last three years were pretty horrific. Um, and that's really what motivated me to want to start this organization. So um, this is what our programs look like pre-COVID. We're finally getting back in the rooms, but um, we've done a lot online. And we were just talking about some of the, the things that make this easier. And um, I have to say, we're embracing Zoom and we're grateful that it exists because it keeps us connected to folks. Um, so just kind of a basic definition of addiction there are a lot of different definitions, but I like this one. And it is a chronic relapsing brain disease. It is identified as a disease or a disorder, depends on who you're talking to and how they define it. Um, but it's characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. So continued use despite things going badly. So for example, alcoholism develops when someone's drinking, causes serious life problems. Substance use disorders or addiction happen when someone's drug use causes serious life problems. But there can also be other kinds of addictive behaviors. So a process or behavioral addiction develops when someone's gambling causes serious life problems, could be shopping, spending, could be sexual activity, pornography, things like that, could be relationships like codependency. It can be eating disorders. Uh, it can be technology and gaming. This has become a huge issue, particularly with young people who are so addicted to these things, these phones that just are right at their fingertips. They are tech native, as we say. And so this is becoming really problematic for a lot of young people in particular. 
But why is it that some people become addicted and others don't? How often I've heard people say, well, I used to do a lot of drinking in college and then I grew up and I stopped and I don't do it anymore. I don't understand why my loved one can't stop. Well, that person's very lucky that they didn't have some of these risk factors, the largest being genetics. So if we look at our family tree, that accounts for like 40 to 60% of our risk for developing an, a substance use disorder or an addiction. Psychosocial emotional challenges, such as um, an, a mental health diagnosis like ADHD or, or depression, <laughs> like, uh, that can be a big contributing factor. Trauma can also fall into this category. Um, also the environment, what is the exposure with the friend group, um, with the use at home, with just even the community or the cultural impacts? So what is the access to use? And all of this is exacerbated by the age of the onset of use. So the younger we use a substance, the more likely we are to have a problem with it. Um, that's because of the way the brain develops. The front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is that that's the part where we make our executive function decisions. Like this might be a bad idea. I should think this through. That's not fully formed until we're 25, roughly 25 years old. So our kids, especially are extremely, extremely vulnerable to having problems if they begin using a substance when they're young. Um, just to give you an idea, um, if this is a national survey that's conducted every year by um, the University of Michigan. It's called Monitoring the Future. <laughs> And it turns out that alcohol is still the substance most used by young people, roughly 46.5% of 12th graders um, have had used um, alcohol that year. 31.5% uh, have been vaping, vaping what? We don't know. I'll talk about that in a moment. And 30.5% have used cannabis. Now the vaping and the cannabis can overlap and I'll talk more about that. But vaping is really interesting because you know, all of our prevention efforts have worked really well to get people to stop smoking cigarettes, like the combustible tobacco cigarettes. Um, lots of really good education, especially for young people, has really helped to decrease cigarette use. Along come these e-cigarettes that are so popular. They're so easy to use. They're so alluring to a young person because, boy, are they cool and they're easy to hide. It's easy to hide the, vape, the smoke that's coming out of it. So it really has complicated things. And how do our young people especially get them? Often it's from a friend or relative. It could be a vape shop or a gas station. They're not supposed to sell them to anyone under 21, but they do, unfortunately. Um, online vendors, you just have to check this box that says, yes, I'm over 21 and they'll send it off to you. So we often caution family members to think about gift cards because gift cards um, that aren't to a specific store can be used to order things online that you can't track. So you're not, if you're not giving them your credit card, then they can use a gift card to order something online. So also advise parents to keep a lookout for packages that come because they might be ordering some of this stuff online. <clears throat> if we look at those uh, young people after they've graduated from high school, so 19 to 30 year olds, um, we see a really big uptick in cannabis use. So um, a 13.32% use in a 10 year period was pretty remarkable. They also, this is the same survey that's monitoring the future. They also looked at hallucinogen use. So that's um, things like um, dust off and ready whoop cans, that's huffing. So there's, that's another thing that a lot of people, and Things like MDMA and ecstasy club drugs have also increased in use. <clears throat> when we talk about cannabis, some of us might have this in our heads, that this is Cheech and Chong. There were movies made with these two characters who smoked a lot of weed. Um, and this, the substances that they were smoking are nothing like what we have out there today when we talk about cannabis. This is what cannabis looks like today. This is the dried flower. Kids call it flower. Um, and this is um, a concentrate or an oil. I'll explain a little bit more about that. So the cannabis plant, when we talk about potency, it's important that we talk about what, what the ingredients are. So THC is the ingredient in cannabis that gets us high. That's, that's the psychoactive ingredient. CBD, there are hundreds of chemicals, by the way. CBD is another one of them. We can't get high from CBD. So when those two um, chemicals are in balance, you really don't get very high from cannabis if it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's when you split that difference and the THC goes up 
and the CBD goes down, that there's more, more of a psychoactive effect. And the THC potency back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, one to three percent THC, really not very potent at all. The average THC level today is 13%. This is in the plant. And the highest they can get that plant to is 30% through hybridization and botany and things like that. 30%, that's the highest. Now comes along these concentrates. Concentrates are made by using a solvent such as butane to strip the THC from the plant, condense it um, in, in cooking it down and condensing it so that it's a very concentrated um, level of THC. And that can get up to 80, 85, even 90% THC. So this is called a cartridge or a cart. That's what you find in the um, medical marijuana dispensaries or in adult use regular dispensaries. I know that you have it legalized in Virginia, but you don't have adult use or, or recreational marijuana in the stores yet, but you can grow plants. Um, but this stuff you're going to see a lot more of once you can sell them in the, the dispensaries for um, recreational use. Edibles are really challenging because first of all, naturally young kids who don't think they're eating something that has THC will eat this and get quite sick. Um, that's a huge problem, but also even people who are intending to get high will eat it and think, well, like if, if they've ever smoked cannabis, they know they get high right away. But if you eat something, your body is, is digesting it. And so it's metabolizing a lot more slowly. So you're not feeling that high. So you're like, I'm going to eat some more now you're getting sick. You're getting really toxic because it's taking longer to hit you. So we're really concerned about edibles for a lot of reasons. And this is what cannabis looks like these days. It does not look like the Cheech and Chong stuff. It does not look like even what my son was using. He's been sober 12 and a half years. This stuff wasn't around then. So it's not even not your dad's weed. It's not your older siblings weed. It's very, very different these days. There's a lot of, there are a lot of myths out there around cannabis. And one of them is that you can't get addicted to it, which is absolutely not true. It doesn't mean that everyone who uses it is going to become addicted. Absolutely not. And it's just like alcohol. Not everyone who drinks alcohol is going to develop a problem with alcohol. I froze up there for a minute, so I don't know what happened, but hopefully we're still okay. We're good. Um, good. And these numbers are Basically, you're looking at the top row is just talking about anyone pretty much of any age who uses cannabis in their lifetime, 9% of them might develop a cannabis use disorder. Um, if you look at those who start using while they're still in their teenage years, that increases the risk to 17%. And these are very much in line with other substances that are used. So yes, you can develop a dependence, especially if you're younger when you start using it. Another myth is that there are no withdrawal symptoms. There absolutely are withdrawal symptoms, particularly if you're using regularly and if you're using these higher potency products. Um, I can tell you that my son was experiencing a lot of these withdrawal symptoms when we were on vacation and he wasn't around his substances. Um, and he exhibited pretty much everything but the weight change because we're only gone for a week. Um, but these symptoms can last for up to two weeks. So it's pretty unpleasant. It really is quite unpleasant. And again, this is higher, uh, higher, more frequent use. There's something that's a relatively new phenomenon, again, because of this stronger potency um, with cannabis called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Hyperemesis just means vomiting. Vomiting is happening uncontrollably. Kids call it scrominging, which means screaming and vomiting because they're dry heaving. They can't stop. Um, they, the only thing that seems to help is a hot bath or shower. We have no idea why, but we talk to a lot of, um, uh, health professionals who tell us, especially in emergency rooms, they're seeing more and more cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome show up and, um, families are very confused by it. They don't understand why it's happening. Um, and it is really disconcerting. Again, this is really for pretty heavy use of cannabis. And unfortunately, we are seeing some associations with um, really severe mental health challenges. So some of these disorders like schizophrenia, like psychosis, anxiety, and depression, uh, cannabis might be exacerbating these things if they are underlying um, genetic risk factors involved, things if you have a predisposition to some of these mental health challenges, 
cannabis can absolutely um, exacerbate some of these things. And I can tell you anecdotally, it's not data. I can tell you anecdotally though, that I'm hearing from so many family members who are witnessing this and experiencing it. And they are extremely frustrated that there's such a um, belief that, oh, it's just weed. It's not a big deal um, because this can have a really powerful impact on people. Hey, Kim, on that point, can I interrupt? Please. Um, so, so yes, I'm a very much aware of this as well with uh, young people in particular um, with psychosis. And what I found amongst friends who are casual users, I didn't even know they used, um, it's it's kind of threatening to them to mention these things. And they um, it, it can cause a strain in the relationship, even talking about this kind of thing. So there's almost a reverse stigma sometimes with casual users, um, yes. and, and, and seeing this kind of thing. So it's, it's a whole different ball game than I used to be a substance abuse counselor 35 years ago. It's, it's totally different. It's so true. You know, we have some social media platforms and when we talk about opioids or, other substances, people are right there with us like, oh, it's so unbelievable. Yeah, we need to help these folks. When we put up information about cannabis, we get a lot of pushback. And I think it is that defensiveness. We are not trying to take away an adult's use of cannabis. We are not, just like we're not trying to, st- we're going to talk about alcohol next. Um, we're, we're not going to try to get people to stop drinking. We're just talking about the fact that there needs to be a greater understanding, uh, particularly with cannabis, of how it's changed. And our focus in our education programs is largely on young people. And that is extremely important to understand that the younger you are, especially with vaping, which is more frequent dosing. You know, if you're vaping cannabis, you're not packing a bowl, you're not rolling a joint, you're not having to hide somewhere because there's so much smell that comes with it. So the dosing is much easier to do frequently and to hide it and and to keep going with it. And people actually lose track of how much they vaped because it's an oil. It's, it's just very different than, than the um, kind of ordeal you have to go through when you're using the flower or the dried plant. So um, yeah, it's, it is very interesting how much people are pretty fierce about this. And I can say too, from my son's use, he loved the culture around it. He loved the friend group connected to it. It validated his use. He believed, and this is, I think, what's really important to note about this is, and I talk to a lot of treatment professionals who work with folks who do have a problem with cannabis use. And what they always say is it's different than other substances. The person who has addicted to opioids, they know that their life is unmanageable. They want to stop they just can't because the craving is so intense. It's very different than cannabis or other substances. Opioids are extremely, um, for those who have a, 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 you know, who are drawn to it, the, the craving is powerful. Um, but with cannabis, they just see, in fact, there's a treatment professional. She runs, she runs a rehab in California. It's very, very well known. And she said, I would rather be treating 10 opioid patients than one cannabis patient because the cannabis patient doesn't want to stop. They just, they're only there because some family member made them or whatever. They fully believe this has made their life better, even though they're vomiting uncontrollably, even though they're aggressive now, or they're completely isolated, amotivational. Um, We're here not talking about the casual user. That's not what we're talking about. Um, We're talking about that that percentage, this 17, nine or 17% of people who this is life-changing for them. It really is. And so that's our focus. But thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you. So moving on to alcohol, which is our cultural drink of choice. Um, As much as we know that there are other substances that have a much more, we're going to talk about opioids next, and and that is absolutely, has a much greater mortality rate, um, much higher risk in, in, in the short term. However, The two substances that kill the most people in this country are tobacco and alcohol, both legal substances. So tobacco is not a substance, but nicotine is, and nicotine is highly addictive. We just talked about it a little bit in vaping, but, but alcohol um, is a a bit more insidious. It just, it's just something that creeps up on us, unfortunately, um, in many cases, again, not everyone, but it's been with us forever from the dawn of time, pretty much alcohol is a part of 
our culture, uh, every culture that's existed pretty much. Um, you can see it throughout history. You can see it in advertising. It's healthy. It's good for you. It's fun. It's social. It's part of sporting events. It's part of celebrations and holidays. I mean, this is just, this is our culture, right? It's everywhere. Uh, imagine being somebody who has alcoholism and is trying to stop drinking. You can't go to the store anymore if you live in a state where it's being sold in retail stores um, without it being right in your face. Um, so I my heart breaks for people who are trying to stay away from this. And we look at it, and these are all images like from things like Etsy, where it's like uh, it's just such a a a um a cultural norming thing. You know, this is a social norm, right? This is where it's like this is okay to do. Everybody does it. It's we need it to have fun. Um, it's a little sad that our kids are getting these messages, mommy juice, you know, this kind of thing, right? So um, you get the idea. Here's a fun gift for someone who turns 21, you know, all the different flavors of vodka. Um, believe it or not, wine pairings for Girl Scout cookies. So yes, our culture loves alcohol and loves to make sure that people think it's absolutely something that should come into every part of our life. Again, it's not going to affect everybody in the same way, but Roughly 10 to 15% of people will develop an alcohol use disorder or alcoholism, like my dad. <clears throat> and I think what's really um, pretty typical of my dad's story is he was a casual drinker most of his life. Um, his marriage to my mother was not doing well the last 10 years of their marriage. And that's when his alcohol use really picked up. Um, and he really was only an, uh, only, he was an alcoholic probably for the last 10 years of his drinking. Um, he, like I said, he's 90 now. So, he would not be 90 if he kept going because he was hospitalized um, for a bleeding ulcer. He had DUIs. Um, he, he, I am so grateful that, that it actually worked when he was 66, that he was able to stop. And um, I still have him today, which is an amazing thing. Um, just looking at all of our use in the United States, um, people 18 and over, I know the drinking age is 21, but this study looked at people 18 and over and in their lifetimes, uh, the population that was surveyed, um, 85% have had some alcohol in their lifetime. Looking at just the past month, which gives us a much better sense of how many people are drinking, uh, rough, well over half of people were drinking in the past month over the age of 18. Um, Alcohol affects us in a lot of ways. It affects, I'm not going to read all of these, but, and I can share this PowerPoint, by the way, Carolyn, if you wanted to post it anywhere. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, absolutely. So it affects our brain. It affects our heart. Uh, of course, it affects our liver. That's probably what's most understood. I, if the pancreas, oh, I know a young woman who developed pancreatitis from her drinking. If she ever drinks again, she's she's been told she absolutely will not survive it. Um, and, uh, it includes, it increases our risk for certain cancers. So it puts us at greater risk for that. And it affects our immune system. Um, this is why I stopped drinking a couple of years ago. I just, we were in COVID. Um, I was alone and I would still have a glass of wine now and then. And I just didn't like that. I was putting all this information out there. Like, why am I still doing this? So, I mean, again, I don't have a drinking problem, so I didn't. I'm not saying that everybody should stop drinking. I just made this choice because you know what? I want a healthy, I'm 61. I want a healthy immune system. And I figured this is going to give me a better shot at being healthy um, as I continue to age, hopefully. Um, a lot of other ways that it can impact us certainly can impact our mental health. This is a depressant. The way alcohol works is we feel better initially. It kind of stimulates at the onset, but it is a depressant. So eventually that's why some of us get weepy when we've had a few drinks, you know, or get a little aggressive. People respond in different ways, but it absolutely can have a long, long lasting effect on mental health if use is continued. <clears throat> so um, we know that it can absolutely impact all those um, different organs. But if we stop drinking, um, if whether it's a problem or not, um, there are a lot of great benefits. So your skin improves, your sleep gets better. Your, you know, there's a lot of fallacy around like oh, the glass of wine before bed. Well, it might help you fall asleep, but it's not going to help you with sleep. It will give you a shorter duration and more interrupted sleep as the night goes on. Um, but obviously improves a lot of other things as well. 
<clears throat> ways to treat alcohol use disorder or alcoholism. So there are medications that can help with the cravings. Um, there's a few listed here, naltrexone, a camp which is Camprol and disulfiram, which is an abuse. These are all medications that can be prescribed to help with the cravings that come with alcohol use. Um, there are of course, talk therapy and interventions and all sorts of ways that we can treat this. Um, but also, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you just pass a basket, put a dollar in or not. That's, that's really saved so many lives really helped my dad tremendously. And my son, as a matter of fact, um, but these are free to attend. Like I said, if you want to put a dollar in the basket, that's all that's asked of you. Um, and that's just considered another layer of support. So perhaps you're taking some of those medications, perhaps you're seeing a therapist, but the groups are meant to be there as a, as a way to reinforce and to connect the connection to other people with that lived experience is really, really important. Really important note about alcohol and as a matter of fact, benzodiazepines such, such as Valium and Xanax. Alcohol and benzodiazepines are the two substances that can be deadly to stop taking without medical assistance. If you've been using them, not just a drink here and there, but I'm talking, you know, serious alcoholism and addiction to benzodiazepines. If you stop using those cold turkey, so to speak, um, you could you could absolutely have serious consequences consequences, including death. So it's very important to get medical help when you stop using them, if you've been using them um, really heavily. COVID has not been good for our population of people who have um, substance use disorders. Drinking decreased um, in about 12 or 13% of people. Uh, there was no change in about 27%, but 60% of, pe of people who were drinking increased their drinking during COVID. Um, in fact, there's something uh, called Drizzly. I don't know if you have this in Virginia, but um, here in Pennsylvania, the only alcohol that can be delivered to the home is beer. Um, there's some legislation pending that might change that, but in many states, you can have alcohol delivered to your home. And COVID uh, saw a huge spike in Drizzly in just one year. If you look at this, this was before COVID, the, the month before COVID was identified, the first month of COVID, and then a year later, you can see how Drizzly really profited from this. And it's pretty unbelievable what was happening. In fact, it looks like overall alcohol sales went up 15%. That's pretty stark considering restaurants were shut down. Bars were shut down for a really long time. So, um, you know, it was hard to walk into a store even. So it's pretty impressive that there was that much of an increase in use. And there's a lot of movement now toward um, being sober curious, you know, not necessarily cutting it out completely, but just trying to reduce or um, taking a month off, giving your body a chance to sort of detox and, and shift a little bit. So lots of ways to um, get healthy. So uh, let's talk a little bit about opioids, just because this is something that has, let me do it on time, has been um, a problem, obviously. And just, just so that we understand what opioids are, um, things that include codeine, um, oxycodone, oxymorphone. So uh, the, the products that we are probably most familiar with are like Oxycontin, um, um, Percocet, those sorts of things. Um, but you can see that this also includes some illicit opioids like heroin. Um, fentanyl can be a medication that can be prescribed. It's sometimes a patch, um, but and they come in different doses. But now we have these synthetic um, products out there that are being made illicitly that are extremely dangerous. This is a big reason that we're losing so many people. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, carfentanil is just completely out of control. And now we have something in our region called um, xylazine that the street name is Trank because it's a tranquilizer. It's actually not an opioid, it's a tranquilizer, but it is showing up in so many of our toxicity reports or medical examiner reports when there's an overdose. It's very scary. Um, I won't get too far into that, but it's it's creeping throughout the country, but it's very heavy in Philadelphia right now. Um, opioids are, are really interesting and they we respond to them very differently than a lot of other substances. And I like this example that if you took 10 people off the street and gave each of them 80 milligrams of Oxycontin, uh, four of them would have, um, oops, somehow that, Okay, the four people out of the 10 would have dysphoria or say, yuck, I hate that feeling. Like for me, for example, I had one Percocet in my life after 
I had minor surgery. I hated the feeling. I'm like, how could anybody like this? And I'm like, no more for me. Thank you. The other four people, the next four people might really kind of like the feeling and be okay with it and joke about like, oh, maybe I'll get my other hip replaced because that wasn't so bad being on that Percocet um, or Vicodin or Oxycontin might be. Um, but for two of those 10 people, this is life-changing. This is a feeling they've never felt before. Um, I've heard people in recovery, we're so lucky that with our programs, we often have a person in recovery who shares their personal story. And when people talk about the first time they've had an opioid, it makes my skin crawl because they are so passionate about it. They'll say, it was like a warm blanket. It was like the friend I always wanted. It was like um, filling a hole inside me that had been there my whole life. Um, one young man said, um, I had my wisdom teeth out. The doctor gave me a bunch of Percocet. He was maybe 17 at the time. He um, had done some drinking here and there, but nothing really serious. He said, I, I took the Percocet. My mom told me to take out the trash about 30 minutes later. I went, I went however long it was. He took out the trash and he said, I looked up and for the first time in my life, I really saw the stars. Like he just, he was somebody who had some depression and anxiety and just, just did it for him. And he moved into heroin. Like that was where it took him. And thank God he's okay today. But this is something that is completely related to genetics. So this isn't necessarily the same for everyone. And this does not mean that the two out of those 10 people are going to become addicted. It means they're greatly at risk though, because they really, really want that feeling again. Tolerance is important to talk about because when any of us even are using it as prescribed, um, over time, we can build a tolerance to it. And tolerance is different than addiction. It's different than dependence even. It just means the more I'm taking it, the more my body is kind of getting used to it. The reason this is so important is we see this happen all the time. Um, people in the treatment field describe this frequently. So you take a certain dose, you're still feeling the pain. It's called a painkiller. So maybe I need more, right? So I'll take some more. I'll take some more. Maybe I'm now moving into um, smoking heroin. Maybe now I'm injecting heroin. So now your tolerance is getting greater and greater and greater. So the dosage is going up and then something happens, whether it's an intervention with your family saying you've got to stop or you're incarcerated because you've gotten in some trouble around this or for whatever reason, um, you stop using that opioid. Um, now your tolerance has gone away. Perhaps now you're coming out of jail, you're coming out of rehab, you just, you've relapsed, you want to pick up again. What often happens is people think they will go, they should go back to the dose they stopped at. Their tolerance is gone. This is where death happens. This is where an overdose can happen. So this is so important to understand that we are extremely vulnerable if we have stopped using an opioid for a period of time, that we don't go back to the use, the dosage that we were using previously. Your body would need to go back. And nobody wants to talk about this because they don't want people to use again. But it's really important that they, we educate folks to understand if you're going to use any kind of opioid again, please start low. Um, so with a low dose. <clears throat> There's an interesting phenomenon that happens um, called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. This is when we've used opioids um, for a period of time. Let's say we had a hip replaced and we're given opioids. If we keep taking them because we're not feeling any relief from the pain and we've become pretty tolerant of it or dependent on it, we start getting pain in other parts of our body. Perhaps that old shoulder injury is bothering us. So um, it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy when we're taking the opioids, it's creating more pain. And then people think like, I need more, I need more. And we hear a lot of people talk about their chronic pain and the need for opioids. Um, opioids are actually not really recommended for non-cancer treatment opioid pain. If you're in cancer treatment, if you have any sort of end of life palliative care, absolutely can be appropriate, but really not for like a chronic injury, pain, things like that. Um, and with oral surgery, they are now recommending no opioids at all. Actually NSAIDs work better, a combination of acetaminophen and ibuprofen work much better for oral pain, oral pain than opioids ever could. So really most oral surgeons and dentists are not using opioids at all for um, post-operative procedures. 
this country has a very different relationship with opioids than a lot of other countries. We make up less than 5% of the world population. We consume 80% of the world's prescribed painkillers. This is not even talking about heroin and what's on the street, prescribed painkillers. If you look just at hydrocodone, which is Vicodin, uh, 99% consumed in the United States, prescribed. Um, these numbers are getting better now. This was at the peak. I'll be honest, this was at the peak. Hopefully we've reined this back. And the reason we got here, and I'm sure this is pretty common knowledge these days, but it was the fifth vital sign that was to, this, this concept came about um, in 1996, 1999. It was part of a the VA, there was a keynote speech where somebody talked about the pain as the fifth vital sign. Vital signs are things like body temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate. These are completely objective measures of, um, of what our vital signs are. Pain management is looking at smiley faces, right? How's your pain? Scale of one to 10. So smiley faces are going away because it's completely subjective and we're the hospitals were going to lose their accreditation if they didn't treat pain. This was all right around the, the 2005 to 2012 or so was when it was at its peak. Thankfully, there's a lot more education out there and healthcare providers are doing a lot, much better job of being more discriminating about this. Um, and the really sad news is that this is not getting better. We were doing a little better in 2018. We saw for the first time a reduction in overdose deaths. And then 2019 picked up a, butt, a bit, and then along came COVID. And the reason for this spike, and then I hate to tell you, but then the next year for 2021, it's not on this chart, but over 100,000 people died. You can see on the chart there, nine, almost 100,000 and then 2021. And a lot of this is because of be, the reason COVID plays a part in this is the isolation. People were, didn't have this life-saving medication called Narcan. Um, which is actually not in this picture. I'm sorry, I thought I had a Narcan picture here. Uh, Narcan is a life-saving overdose reversal because we go into respiratory arrest when we are overdosing on an opioid. And this brings us, it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing um, drug, but these are other ways to assist with, with detoxification. Sorry, this doesn't show Narcan. Um, but basically that is a big reason is there's a lot more isolation and people were just not having the same kind of access to care to treatment, um, to even meetings and things like that to get the kind of help that they needed. And, and we're just not seeing a, a drop in this again. So we're very, very concerned about opioids. And um, I, we're very lucky to work with some um, county coroner's offices who tell us that polysubstance use is everything right now. So there is no pure heroin in a medical examiner's report anymore. It's just mixed with all sorts of things, including stimulants, by the way, which are very much on the rise. <clears throat> so I mentioned just a couple of these, these products that are available to help with opioid use disorder. Um, Suboxone, Subutex is another really interesting one that's more available these days. Methadone and, and Vivitrol. Vivitrol shots um, are given every 30 day, every 28 days, I guess it is. Um, they can help tremendously with cravings. Um, but some other options, interventions. We did an intervention with our son. He did not think he needed any help. Uh, we could see that this was not getting better. And so we hired a professional to help us get him into treatment, which actually worked. And that was 12 and a half years ago. So um, we're very thankful for that intervention. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, 12-step meetings, other kinds of support groups, group counseling, IOPs or intensive outpatient programs, partial hospitalization programs. So these are different, different levels of structure and care. Some are, are more um, time consuming than others. Inpatient, um, I'm a big believer in it really, again, helped with my son um, in monitoring programs. So for professionals such as nurses, physicians, um, pilots, lawyers, there are, there are actually a number of different fields that have some really successful monitoring programs so that people can get their licenses back. Um, there's, of course, an increased risk, especially in the healthcare professions because of access. Um, people who work in hospice care are very, very susceptible because they're working in a field that elicits a lot of, brings up a lot of trauma for them and losing patients that they might feel connected to. And then they have all this access to um, really high potency um, painkillers. So, and then recovery housing is huge. It's really helpful. Um, so I mentioned earlier that this, this um, need for change, you know, like that if somebody's not, um, 
not making a change because of the consequences. I, I just love this quote that we change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And I'll use my son again as an example that he did not see any reason to change. I hit my bottom. I couldn't watch what was happening to him another minute. Neither could his dad. That's why we stepped in with this interventionist and said, can't happen anymore, at least not under our roof. Um, and so we needed to learn a lot about codependency. So if you don't mind, I have a four minute video that I'm going to play. Is that okay, Carolyn? It's absolutely wonderful. Okay. So I'll stop talking and play this video. Four minutes. It's a cycle. You know, addiction is based in a cycle and, and the cycle just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And my state without anything in me is restless, irritable, discontent. Then I would use and I would feel good. I don't know if it's the way our brain is structured or, or what, but man, something clicks and it's the best feeling you've ever had in your entire life. You have this allergy and the allergy happens when you start to ingest the booze or the chemicals. It's not like the allergy of strawberries or, or peanuts where your throat closes up. It's, it's like just the opposite. Your throat opens up and wants more. I was never able to use just a little. I always struggled with, you know, okay, I'll just use on the weekends. I'll just use at parties. That just wasn't me. And when I started within a year, I was using every day, all day long. And so when you use that way, there are consequences. You know, you get in trouble with the law, you lose friends. And so those consequences are painful and I didn't want them. And so I would tell myself, okay, I've got to stop. I'm going to stop. And I would make these promises and these resolutions about how I was going to change. And, and then I would, I would, for a period of time, feel a little bit better because the consequences weren't happening. But the problem was, was that eventually, without a drug or a substance, I would eventually go back to that natural state of restless, irritable discontent. And I had this mental obsession it was like the memory of how amazing it was to be high always outshone the memory of how painful it was or how I said I was never going to do it again. And I would begin to kind of concoct these ways I was going to make it be different this time. It was not, I'm going to use, but I'm not going to get those same consequences. And I would use, I would tell myself, it's just going to be a little, it's just going to be at this time. And I would just blow it like within a day and I'd be totally out of control. And so then it would get painful and I would say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. And I would make a resolution and I would make a promise and I would stop. And then my old problem of how I felt would come back and I would do it again. The cycle of addiction and codependency, it's two sides of the same coin. You have the addict, which I am one, and you have the codependent. The codependent gets addicted to the addict. Codependent solution is uh, getting in there and fixing this alcoholic. And they get in there and they have to be around them all the time. And the allergy or, or the craving becomes the person, the loved one that they're getting in there trying to fix or rescue. And they tell themselves, okay, if I just love them harder, uh, and that becomes the addiction, and then that addict spits in their face and they go, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to get back into this whole behavior. I'm not going to rescue them. And they really mean it. Just like the addict says, I'm not going to get drunk or high again. I'm not going to get in there and rescue them again or, or fix them. Then they come over here and they become restless here and will discontent it also. They become restless. They might not have heard from their loved one. So they get in there and they try to fix it again. And so right there, that mental obsession is, well, I got to get in there. Oh, you know, he's doing so well. He has 11 months of sobriety now. I can get in there and I can buy him this or do this for him. And that mental obsession gets in there and up, they're back into trying to control the whole situation. And boom, we're back to the races again. Isn't that great? <laughs> I think they did such a good job with that. 
So I just thought we'd talk a little bit about, about the family because that's where I'm coming from. And that's who the majority of our audience is family because we're trying to understand what's happening to our loved one. So I think just talking about codependency and the way we can become addicted to our to our loved one and their problem and their challenges and keeping them safe or alive or we get angry. I mean, there's so many different ways that we can respond, but I just love this kind of comparison of, um, and, you know, there's there's this saying and L and on meetings are for the family members. So it's like AA is for the person with an alcohol use disorder. Al Anon is for the family members or NAR Anon or other support groups like that. And they have this expression to detach with love. I can't stand that expression. I love so much about the 12, so much about the 12 step programs. I can't handle the detach with love. I can't detach from my kid or my dad. I love them. You know, how does that work? I, so I've changed that to my mind to disengage from the chaos. So I can still love my son, but I don't have to be there for um, the behaviors that come with it, or the I'm out of money again, or I'm in trouble again, or I need a lawyer again. You know, I can disengage from that part of it and still love my my loved one, you know, and have a relationship with them on a very, and it might look differently than I want it to, but I can still have that relationship. So anyway codependent thinking is if you love me, I'll love me. Like it's all about, you know, and, and so much of the things that you see on the left in that blue section are, um, are they're just natural things that we do when we've got fear or anger or frustration or confusion. Um, and they're kind of things that we do to make ourselves feel better in some ways. You know, um, if I fix them, I'll feel like I'm doing something. You know, um, if I, um, if I have another lecture, this is going to be the magic thing that I'm going to say, that's going to change things. And boy, did we do a lot of lecturing that was completely pointless. I'm pretty sure all my son wanted to do was get away from us and go get high because it was killing him to see us so upset. He had so much shame in this that me crying and lecturing and begging and can't you see, can't you see was just driving him further into the use. It wasn't my fault. I was doing the best that I could with what I had. I didn't know a lot of this stuff then, but I can learn that if I take care of myself, that if I get educated, if I um, uh, seek help, you know, that, that is not. So I always share the story. We took our son to see when he got in trouble in college, we weren't ready to admit that he had a drug use problem. We knew there was some drug use, but we just didn't want to think it was an addiction. So we took him to a mood and anxiety disorder specialist. He spent some time with her. He told her exactly what she wanted to hear. He gave her just enough information to sound remorseful and forthcoming. Um, and then he even said, oh, you can have my parents come in. And we, we're very open, my family, you know? So we, so Michael and I go in and and she says to us in front of Daniel, didn't you guys get high in college? Come on. And I mean, this was this great opportunity to nip this in the bud. And we were like, we must be crazy. I guess we're overreacting. And so away he went to continue, continue his use. And it got much worse before it stopped completely finally with the intervention. But um, we took him to the wrong therapist. She's a perfectly good therapist for mood and anxiety disorders, not for somebody with a drug addiction. So I often will say to family members, please don't be afraid. We would take our loved one to a specialist if we thought there was any other health concern that we wanted to rule out the worst case scenario. Take some, take your loved one to a specialist if you think there's an addiction. Take them to someone who understands. You can find it on their profile if they deal with addictions. It's so important because then somebody would have recognized his deception and what the way they would ask the right questions and that sort of thing. So I really don't blame her. Um, I don't blame us either. We really, truly thought we were doing the right thing for him. Everything that happened needed to happen. Thank God nobody got hurt along the way. But um, anyway, um, it can be really hard to be on the same page with another family member. Um, we hear, and thankfully, again, Michael and I were on the same page. We're absolutely united. But there were still times that we weren't in agreement on something. We needed a third party to kind of help us with a lot of that. Because there's a lot of emotion around this. Um, there's a lot of blaming sometimes, you know, so it can be very, very hard for families to, um, to be really united on this stuff. And it's important to at least behind the scenes, have those negotiations, like what are we going to agree to as we confront our loved one so that we at least have appear to have a united front. 
And another thing is, especially we're talking about a young person, they are even in an older version, but if there are children, they're expert at knowing which of us to go to. Um, kind of the the splitting, you know, the divide and conquer, you know, oh, I know that the dad's a little easier sell on this or, you know, whatever. So mom's a hard case. So I'm going to go to dad or whatever that looks like. Um, so a lot of times we'll recommend to family members, um, you know, screen your calls. Like if you're, if your loved one's not living with you, but they're constantly asking for money or favors or getting them out of trouble or whatever, um, let it go to voicemail listen to it together with the other parent, other family members, you know, whatever's involved and come to some agreements before you get back in touch. Because I can tell you that what happened to me all the time. And I hear this routinely from parents, especially fear hijacks my brain where the drugs have hijacked my child's brain, fear hijacks my brain. I'm reactionary instead of responsive. Um, It would help tremendously if I had thought things through, sought counseling, gone to one of my support groups, that sort of thing really helps a lot. Uh, The elephant in the room is the addiction, right? So the holidays are coming. I can't tell you every single year, this is a number one topic for our support groups that we have. How do I handle this? We normally have the family over and they expect us to have wine. Should we have wine? Or we always go in our case, cousin Nancy's house. Nobody there is an alcoholic, but they serve wine. What's that going to mean for Daniel? Should we go this year? Should we skip it? You know, you have to make all these decisions. And a lot of times it's up to that person, like what's their comfort level? Um, You know, bring a sober friend to a wedding, for example. Um, You know, so there's that. But the the elephant especially is hard because um, we really don't want the world to think poorly of our loved one. And so we... Um, we isolate and we hide this and we make it a secret. I will propose that if we make this a secret, it, it just really reinforces that stigma. Why is it a secret? This is not a bad person. This is someone who um, has a brain disorder. This is someone who quite innocently was using a substance. I mean, who would really blame a 16 year old for sneaking a beer, you know, but for some 16 year olds it changes their life. It takes them down a road that nobody ever expected. And um, sometimes it's a way to self-medicate. It's a way to cure a social anxiety. It's a way to deal with a parent's divorce. It's a way to deal with life and it can get out of control for about 10 to 15% of the population. So um, if we could re- try to reduce the stigma around this, then it wouldn't have to be something that we um, keep in the shadows and hide about because that does exacerbate this this idea that it's a bad person and something to be ashamed of. Um, I'm just as proud of my son in his using days as I am today. Um, frankly, I feel like he was doing only what he what he felt was keeping him going through life at that time. And, um, and it just got out of control. And we were so lucky that we were able to um, get him to some appropriate supports. Um, the best thing we can do for our loved ones is to take care of ourselves. It really and truly is. This sounds selfish. And when you, you know, hear people say like, oh, self-care, self-care, like, how can I take care of myself when they're in pain? Yes, you can. You have to, because if you are an empty vessel, you have nothing to give. There's a reason that when we're on a plane, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you help someone younger than you or your child. That's because you're no use to your child if you're past that on the plane. Same thing goes for me and my catastrophizing and running around like my hair was on fire when my son was addicted. I was not helping. I didn't know what to do. I needed to stop, take a breath. We have this acronym, wait, why am I talking? I was, like I said, the lectures, the begging, the pleading, I needed to stop and understand this and understand how I could get appropriate help for my son and not homeschool it. So um, therapy is so helpful for a lot of us. Um, and boundary setting, I'm going to move a little bit faster because we're getting closer to the end. I'm going to give us a time to talk. Um, boundaries are really important in so many aspects of our lives. Um, boundaries are not necessarily rules. It's kind of how we respond to the rules being broken. You know, it's, it's, um, recognizing that I'm doing that thing again, where I'm solving his problems. I'm trying to make everything bad go away, or I'm losing my own, um, self-respect, you know, by doing lying for him or, um, 
gaslighting my friends or my mother or whatever it was trying to do to keep him protected. Um, so setting a boundary is for me. It's not necessarily for them. It's for me. Um, and I, I like this. I only have this in here to remind me to do this. But when we say letting go, when we say detach with, from the chaos and things like that, I like to think about it like this. So if, if we think about letting go, we might think like, I've got this grip on my loved one. So I'm supposed to let go. So it looks like this, like we're letting go. Letting go can look like this. I've let go. I don't have that. Oh, I got to control, control, control. I'm going to let go, but I'm going to be supportive. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be the lighthouse parent. I'm going to be the parent firmly on the shore, guiding you when you're ready for the help. So that's just how we can let go in a loving way um, without getting, you know, they say, let go or let God. I like to say, let go or get dragged. Because if I don't let go, I'm going to go down with you. I'm going to get as sick as, if not sicker. And I was at least as sick as my son when he was in his act of use. Presenting a united front, like I said, talking to the other parent or other family member behind the scenes is so, so important um, for them to see that we're consistently going to be here for you. We love you. Absolutely. We will always be willing to support any efforts for your recovery, we won't support your addiction anymore. We're not going to pay for another lawyer. We're not going to rescue you again, but we will absolutely be here for you when you're ready for help. And this is one of my favorite things. This is this applies to like all kinds of things in life. The things inside this green circle are my responsibility. My words, behaviors, actions, efforts, mistakes, ideas, and consequences of my actions. What is not my responsibility or the other person's words, behaviors, mistakes, actions, and the consequences of all those things are not my responsibility. They're not. And if we're continually rescuing them, the message we're giving them is you're not capable of doing this yourself. You need me. You're, you know, you're not, you can't do this. You need me. We need to have faith in our loved ones that they can get this. That is all that I have. I threw a lot of content at you guys. Um, so I, that was like a condensed one of all of our programs, all wrapped up in a very giant PowerPoint presentation. So thank you for listening to me for an hour solid. Thank, thank you so much, Kim. And um, we had some folks join us a little later. So I just want to let you know, this is being recorded. You're more than welcome to ask a question or make a comment. And um, we will blank out your name and all that. So don't worry about that. There's anonymity should you like it. Um, I would like to just make a couple comments. First, I want to thank you so much for your just your transparency about your life and the people in your life and your experience. And thank you for being so clear about lots of different substances that are around today because it really has changed. And those of us who are older, um, you know, there's a lot of information you gave us that we probably wouldn't know about unless someone like you shared it with us. So thank you for that as well. Um, you know, your your title of your place is Be a Part of the Conversation. And I just wanted to share, I remember when I was a substance abuse counselor, this woman sharing, she said, you know, I'd get some good, I'd get some good months behind me. And, um, and she had a daughter and her mother would take care of her daughter. And she said, then my mother saw me healthy and she was so angry about all the things that I had done. So she would, and she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't get angry at me when I was using, cause she was afraid she was walking on those eggshells. But then when I was recovering and my mother would get angry, I felt this shame and I'd go out and use again. So, you know, the point you made about everybody needs to take care of themselves is so important because yeah, that anger is justified, but you know, in early recovery, maybe if you go and talk to a therapist or a support group or Al-Anon or something about that, instead of the person, you're helping them and yourself, you know, that's just one example that really stuck out with me about how challenging it is for someone who's really trying, um, you know, making those connections back with family and they're not always easy mm -hmm. and how it's so important to take care of yourself as well. We can, we can love the person, but hate the addiction. We can do that, you know, and there's an exercise that I recommend a lot when there's that anger it was something that I was, it was, it was suggested that I do this early on and when Daniel was in treatment and um, it was to write a letter to my loved one's addiction, not to him, not hmm. to Daniel, but to his never to see not for his eyes at all, but it was an opportunity for me to write to his addiction 
And man, it was had some colorful language in it. Let me tell you, I got out all my anger. You know, you you robbed his future. You you took you stole him from us. You you know divided our family. You know you, all that kind. Of, I just took it all out on the disease, and I re- it really really helped because then it morphed into really what it did to him, not just what it did to me and our family. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really helped me to um, to see there's my, in this case, my son, and then there's the behaviors that come with his addiction, you know, and there's a friend of mine who's also a parent and she has a son. um, We'll say his name is Tom, but she calls him Baxter when he's not being Tom anymore. And she's like, I feel like Baxter might be back. And that means that he's returned to use, you know, that he's using again. And um, Baxter's just not Tom, you know, like it's just, um, there's, That's what I think that's why there's so much stigma around substance use disorders. The behaviors are so unseemly. There's theft, there's lying, there's deception. And lying is fascinating to me. And I love what I learned from people in recovery. Lying is their friend. Lying is their protective factor. It is, it is like, I, if, if I'm somebody with a substance use disorder, I can't get up without a drink, without whatever my drug of choice is, right? Let's say it's alcohol. If I wake up and I need alcohol, that's the only way I'm going to get through the day. You know, if I'm truly an alcoholic, I'm going to be shaking. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to start getting sick. Um, I need that. If you get in my way as my loved one, I'm going to have to come up with a way to keep going so that you don't get in my way. So I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to gaslight. I'm going to do all these things. And um, I've heard this more than once from people in recovery. And I, one of my colleagues who was just here a couple hours ago is one of them who says, even once he got sober, he kept lying because it was so natural to do. It just became such a, a knee jerk sort of thing to do. And it felt safe. It, again, it was protective. I mean, the, the wisdom that comes, and there's another guy who told me once about, um, he said, I was addicted to the chaos that my addiction brought as much as I was to the drug. And he didn't figure that out until like his fifth or sixth rehab. And he was living in a recovery house and his, the head of the house was like, so what's your biggest fear? He's like, well, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to relapse. It always happens. He's like, why do you think it happens? He's like, I don't know. I got, you know, I've got drug dealers after me. I've got court cases pending. I've got this. He's like, that's what you're addicted. That's your normal. And this Mm -hmm. doesn't feel normal to you you're supposed to be up by seven 30. You have to make your bed. It's your turn to unload the dishwasher. We've got a meeting at 7 PM. You got to be there on time. That's not your normal. This feels so uncomfortable to you. What's normal is numbing all your feelings, not dealing with life on life's terms because I I can't handle, I need to shut my brain off. Um, and now you're feeling your feelings, you're alone, the dishwasher, you're supposed to be somewhere soon. Like that's not normal to you. And he said, I was addicted to the chaos of my life. I didn't know how to behave without it. Wow. That was powerful. Mm. Mm. Anyone else, any questions or comments? I mean, I have a jillion, but I want to open it up to the folks, other folks too. This has been wonderful, Kim. Surely. Thank you so much. It's, uh, you know, uh, I have two daughters and one is, is addicted and our family is really close and we have fun together and we love to be together. And, you know, we're into exercise, we're into food, uh, doing little adventures and things like that. And, and sometimes the younger daughter is with us with uh, uh, altered, altered with alcohol, you know, and, you know, it's it's so hard to deal with. I I keep saying, do I need to go to Al-Anon? You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's just the elephant in the room. It is. I do not feel like that I rescue, I feel like I have a really, really good life. I'm so grateful for so much I have. And when bad feelings come up, I just put them in the garbage. I really, and I don't know if I'm doing that too much, but um, 
you know, I mean, I have a good life and this just breaks my heart to see how she is destroying her life. She has had so many friends and bringing them to my home where it's really nice for entertaining a swimming pool, a big yard, you know, lots of fun and everything. And, and most of the time, it's really, really good. I, she's so smart. She's so fun. <laughs> so I'm here today because I don't know what to do. And I cannot deal with it. I mean, this is my my perception or my feeling or whatever. I can't deal with it with my other daughter. Those two daughters are very close. They're very different. One is married, the younger one is not. And there are two, two grandchildren for me, which uh, the younger one who's addicted is really, really close to because she's so fun. <laughs> so it's just a, it's, it's heartbreaking. But I, I must say that I have a good life and I don't know whether I rescue her just because I don't do anything. Uh, we are, like I say, we're really close together, but we've never been a family that gets into deep feelings. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was that way when I was growing up too. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, yes. thanks so nice you. to hear your stories. Oh, of... thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, you brought up such an important point, which is siblings, you know, the sibling of the person with the substance use. And I have, I neglected to mention that I also have a daughter. She was in that picture, one of those pictures. Um, you know, the siblings often just sort of fall through the cracks. And I love that you said that you do some fun things with her, you know, and I, I, I would encourage you to have that fun time and avoid perhaps this topic of her sister. And if, if, if possible, unless she wants to talk about it, because I know that a lot of time what this does come up in our support group meetings is that we parents, especially want to see our kids love each other and have this beautiful relationship. So we might be trying really hard to control that, that relationship and defend one to the other. There's a lot of that, right? Defending one to the other and um, or trying just to make excuses and things like that. Um, and that that can be hurtful to the person who's frustrated, you know, to the sibling who's not. So so about. what what you're saying is be careful that the the sibling is included. I, I, I'm not quite I don't quite yeah. have it because I actually my activity is uh, closer with the older sibling who's married and has, you know, has, we have, I have two grandchildren who are you know, 28 years old, 27 or whatever. And so they invite me to do things. I, I probably not more than two days passes and I hear from the older one. Now I, I initiate things with the younger one who's has the addiction problem, but she also initiates things with me and oh mom we love to do things with you and <laughs> but um you know and those two are very close okay. and i i know they share a lot of things that i'm not involved that doesn't involve me but uh anyhow i just i feel like i've i i feel like um that i that I'm close to both of them, but there is that, um, you know, there's addiction problem with the younger one, but I'm really close to, to the older one. And I do more things with the older one. I mean, we live very close together, all of us, all three mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. My husband has been gone for, has, died 19 years ago. And mm -hmm. he's the most fabulous father. I am so lucky i am so grateful you know he loved their music he loved their friends he loved to play with them he is it was just it was just wonderful 
No, the, so the only I, point I, I feel, and you know, my kids have both said to me, you know, we get together every year on his, my, his birthday and the day he died with, with the children and uh, with all the families and the, the mother-in-law of the older one and, and somebody else we've adopted into our family who's a friend. And so, okay, what's my point? What am I getting to now? Um Oh, oh, okay. They acknowledge that they had a wonderful growing up with their mm-hmm. dad. He was a teacher and he had time to spend with him because he'd be home like at four o'clock, four thirty in the afternoon <laughs> when I'm tired. And right. <laughs> Anyhow, Aww. that's my story. Some well, of it. Sounds <laughs> like a lovely family. I mean, you no, know, my, my point about the the thing with the two sisters was to basically to respect the feelings of your sister who is not using alcohol alcoholically um that if she has any negative feelings to validate them to rather than to go into defensiveness at all um but and negative feelings about what about her sister who's uh-huh. drinking you know uh-huh. i don't know well, if that's something don't talk about it because well, i don't okay. i want to hurt that older person sure daughter i don't sure has has your younger daughter ever had any kind of treatment um at all has has she yeah, been I'm through, uh, yes i think she has we haven't talked about it she has and you know what is really sad too she's uh immune immune deficient autoimmune what's, deficient. what's the expression immune immune uh, deficient an autoimmune deficiency yes yes she's okay. that and yeah and she's so she's so smart she yeah. i know she's really struggling because yeah. she she does work on it i know she does but there are gaps. <laughs> you can absolutely approach the subject without um, putting up a wall with her just to say, um, if you were ever in, you know, to say to your your younger daughter, um, if you would ever want to talk with me about um, getting some help with your drinking, I'm here for you, uh-huh. you know, just to, if you can be as calm as possible when they're having this uh-huh. discussion. Uh-huh. The, the thing is we want to keep communication going. We won't, don't want to drive our loved one underground with this. You know, uh-huh. we just want them to know how much we love them. I, you're, you know, you're an amazing person. I just want to be here for you. And I see you struggling. And I just want you to know if, if you're ever ready to get some help, I want to help you by, uh-huh. you know, getting, I'm sure Carolyn can help yeah. you find some connections to, yeah. to resources in the community. Sure. Um, there are, there are loads of people yeah. who can help with that. Um, if you were local, I would absolutely connect you with, with some of our providers, but, um, you know, sometimes I've heard people say too, that, um, there's, there's one woman who I know her son had a drug problem for a number of years. And when they finally confronted him, he said, he actually said to them, what were you waiting for? You know, he, he wasn't about to stop things himself. It's very, very unusual for someone it's not out of the question, but it's rare for somebody to say, boy, I better nip this in the bud. I got to do something about this. Only when there's some kind of consequence, like they've lost their job, they've had a DUI, they lost their license, they've oh, hurt yeah. somebody. That's when sometimes that's calling like hitting hitting a bottom. There are many, many bottoms that can go deeper and deeper, but um, we don't want to wait for that to happen. You know, right. so sometimes, like I said, I hit a bottom. I couldn't stand watching what my son was doing to himself anymore. I couldn't stand the, you know, the lying and the the behaviors and the mm-hmm. the fear that I had and the sleeplessness and all that stuff. I couldn't do it anymore. So that's why we intervened. And um, it can be a really loving thing to do. Um, and, and I also have heard people say that it might, you Maybe your words won't change things, but maybe the fifth person that week that says something to her will do the trick. So when we tell someone you're worth getting help, you know, you're a real, I love you so much. You're such a valuable person and you're worth getting help in your life. You deserve a better life than this, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know she she has worked on it. I know she has worked on it and, you know, she has fabulous friends but i do and she mentions one one in particular who's so understanding you know they're so um i don't know uh, understanding friends <laughs> but mm-hmm. i i do think that some of those relationships have been a damn affected you know and, and, and 
in a mm -hmm. in a way that's not not desirable but anyhow so i appreciate your help i think that's a you know i i yeah i will um i will work on it more and i absolutely recommend al-anon i absolutely do recommend al-anon al uh -huh. meetings yep uh -huh. al-anon they're online, they're in person, they're, they're, uh -huh. but I'm sure okay, you can find yeah. any, okay. they are phenomenal. Um, it just helps so much to be in the room with other people who get what you're going through. It, yeah. It, yeah. It's everything. Yeah. It's the reason AA has worked since 1935 because uh -huh. they understand each other and yeah. we family members understand each other. We know the pain, we know all, all those feelings. So uh -huh. I really strongly encourage Al-Anon. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll do that. Speaking from uh, the perspective of having gone to Al-Anon meetings myself for loved ones um, and also being a substance abuse counselor many moons ago, um, I can attest to that. It's just very helpful. I got some good ideas that I would have never gotten anywhere else on how to manage my emotions, my feelings. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, it was, it was a grandfather. Uh, it wasn't my parents. It wasn't my siblings. It was my grandfather who really wasn't around that much, but mm -hmm. it affected the other generation so much. And I had no idea mm -hmm. how much I was affected by his use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was very, very, very helpful. Very, mm -hmm. very helpful. Good time in my life which sounds yeah, weird, a good time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but there is a genetic component, you know, there's alcohols on my side of the family and my sure. husband's side. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, Kim, you're the name of your company being a part of the conversation, just like we're doing tonight. Um, that's a big part of Al-Anon meetings, mm -hmm. being a part of the conversation and being a part can be just listening. Mm -hmm. It can be talking every time. It can be a little of both. It's pretty magical. It really is. Yeah. And you said that it was a good time in your life. I, I, we talk about this all the time. The gifts that come with this are unbelievable. It really is. I feel like you gain so much insight when you understand empathy. And I know I heard somebody say, um, we were having a gratitude meeting one time. We always do that around Thanksgiving. We have a gratitude meeting and somebody said, I'm grateful that became, I became a less judgmental person. And mm -hmm. I, I just really love that, that that's so true. Like I probably had a lot of, you know, pretty unpleasant thoughts about people who were drug addicts and things like that. And then I had a son who was one and I became a lot less judgmental. You know, I realized that's not because I was a bad parent or he's a bad person. This is, this is, um, it affects so many more people than we realize. And when we are transparent as our family, God love my entire family for letting me do this work and be very public. I mean, our son has been on programs, you know, um, as a panelist and, and others, you know, it, I'm just so grateful to them because I, the first few years in our community where this started, I couldn't go to the grocery store. Seriously. I was like, I'm not saying I was like a celebrity, but it was like they people, cause I was the home and school parent. I was like super, both my kids were active in activities at school. So I knew so many families, I would go to the grocery store and people would be like, so tell me about that interventionist or, oh, my niece or, oh my God, my brother-in-law, or I don't know what to do about my, my mom's drinking or, you know, it was like everywhere I went. And I'm so grateful that my family was cool with me being so, you know, transparent about it because I mean, I've heard from teachers and my kids, I mean, it just goes on and on and on because they know I'm a resource and I don't have all the answers, but my God, the network of treatment professionals and people who understand this is huge. There's a whole world out there that deals with this and mental health challenges and all those things um, that, that I can thankfully be a conduit. You know, like I said, I don't have the, all the answers. I know how to get you the answers though. So um, it, there are so many gifts that come with this. And I don't think, especially being that my son is a male um, when he was, you know, in treatment at the age of 21, he lost, it was like three months into his recovery that he lost his grandfather, my father-in-law, who is so dear to all of us. And 
I remember, and we were so worried about Daniel because that was really early in his recovery. He was so vulnerable and he was living in a recovery house with a bunch of, you know, young 20 year something guy, 18 of them in a house together. And when Michael, my ex-husband went to pick him up to bring him to the memorial that was at our house, Daniel had not been in our house since his intervention. And now we're having a memorial with 200 people coming through with my father-in-law's ashes by the fireplace and all that. And when, when Michael brought him down or I picked him up and Michael took him back or something like that. But he said to us, my whole house, the recovery house had a meeting the night before um, to support Daniel and to talk about the whole group of guys sat in a circle and talked about either family members that they've lost or they told stories about their grandparents. Daniel told stories about his grandfather. He, and he was like so emotional. And he said, I have so much support. I'm like, where else would a 21 year old have that opportunity? Mm-hmm. Boy, especially, sorry, you know, men, but that's just the, the reality that our boys just don't talk about their feelings that much. And he had that gift. Um, never would have happened without recovery. Never, you know, so just amazing opportunities come the gifts of desperation, as they say, in alcoholics. Hmm. Yeah. And again, Carolyn, um, our guest, Carolyn, you know, I said early on, my dad got sober at 66, never too old to find recovery. Thank you. (laughs) I'm speaking of your daughter, of course, but yeah. I'm just um, thank you. An excellent uh, discussion. Sorry, I was late. Uh, I'm here in part because I have colleagues that are organizing a lot of exciting things with the uh, Positive Links program uh, with with cell phone access to just communicate among people who are undergoing uh, uh, struggles with addiction mm-hmm. disorders and. Uh, I've been tremendously impressed by that. And the whole family dynamics, I think everybody has them. Uh, 15%, you start doing the number of people that that involves. There are very few families. If you go a generation or two away and you don't see that uh, (laughs) everywhere. And uh, uh, we're grandparents that struggle with some of that, some parents in the past, but uh, uh, these, uh, I just think open conversations are really important. Keep up the good work. And I don't know how you get more people involved. I'm uh, sorry that uh, this this number is small, but obviously important. And uh, uh, but just wanted to thank you for doing this. Thanks. Thank you for that. You know, a lot of colleges and universities are so impressive. There are a lot of collegiate recovery programs that are starting around the country. And while they've been around for years, Rutgers was the very first and theirs is very robust. Um, But there are quite a few these days and their outcomes are phenomenal. I mean, the the engagement with it, those kids have with the program, um, they average a higher GPA than the rest of the campus. You know, I mean, they, there's a lot of accountability. They build a fellowship, which is huge to have a fellowship and of support. And um, yeah, they're, I love collegiate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they, uh, it actually started out interesting with, with uh, people in Southwest Virginia who had no access but had uh, mm. terrible struggles with their HIV infections. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> just as easy person, but uh, uh, they got so involved in that, and of course there was a lot of addiction linkage there as well. Mm. And, uh, and they actually were able to improve care and reduce costs. Um, that became a statewide program to. Uh, get the support for that but anything that works is right. important thank you peers i think are critical and in some respects we're all peers that's correct <laughs> yeah exactly well thank you for that i appreciate it Dick. thank you it sounds like great work i'm i'm very thrilled about that yeah technology let's use it for the betterment absolutely 
I was a skeptic, to be honest. Uh, you know, this is not the kind of thing you talk about over a cell phone. But they've gotten ways to figure out, uh, you know, protection of uh, of uh, privacy and mm. and and develop the trust, which is obviously a challenge these days for uh, anybody. <laughs> it seems medical profession, especially. But um, but anyway, thanks. Uh, there's a lot, obviously, that you just touched on uh, kind of about some of the uh, drug uh, assistance with getting uh, control of things and the mm -hmm. complexity of that challenge with that um, is is huge. And even, uh, well, chronic pain management is mm -hmm. obviously a hugely challenging area, all of which are Very. outside of expertise, except that I see it <laughs> it is very complicated we all do yep yep but thank you and thank everyone for sharing thanks my pleasure well technology brought us together tonight that's a good thing <laughs> that's right that's right well thank you for offering to share your powerpoint and um and if anybody who's on this wants that or if you're watching this on our uh web page um our youtube site uh, you can email me, Carolyn, C A R O L Y N, at the center and I'd be happy to give you that. Um, thank, thank you, Kim. You. Yeah, thank you, Kim, and everyone else for your time, your expertise, and just for being you. It's just so refreshing to be able to talk openly about things like this that are so important and to let other people know it's okay. And, um, you know, that's just that's a gift. Thank you for that gift. Thanks, Carolyn. It was so nice to see you. I'm so grateful that we met and, and we could do this together. And thank you for what you're doing. I love it. I think it's wonderful. Just Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Well, you all have a good night. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Night. Thanks.